Good morning, welcome back. Today is May 23rd and as you can see I am back outside on the deck because, well, at the moment it's not raining. And so let's talk today, uh, before it does start raining, about what happened on this date, May 23rd. Well, first of all, in 1618, today is the day of the second defenestration of Prague. The second defenestration of Prague. Prague, of course, is the capital of the Czech Republic. It's a city that I have been to that you can tell from this very nice plate that I picked up in an airport um, on our way back. I traveled there in 2001, uh, an interesting time. And for those who don't know where the Czech Republic is, uh, well, you know, if you're looking at a map of Europe, you kind of look at, get to, you know, England is on the left, and then you've got France and Spain, Italy down here. You kind of keep going toward the right. A little bit to the south and you'll get to the Czech Republic. Uh, historically it, it encompasses the area usually referred to as Bohemia and Transylvania. So if you've ever watched Dracula and you've seen them gone to the Transylvanian mountains you're generally in the area of the Czech Republic. But on this date in 1618 there was a religious division in the in the kingdom of Bohemia between the Protestants and the Catholics. Now the Catholics uh, although the Protestants had the numerical advantage, but because there were so many disparate groups, uh, the Catholics, being more unified, had most of the actual political power. Now, there was an agreement where the Protestants were able to build churches and, you know, worship freely, and so, uh, but the Catholics were, at the time, resisting that. The Protestants, in, uh, in protest, sent a letter to the emperor, uh, who was a guy named Matthias at the time, saying, hey, we want to build our buildings and the Catholics aren't letting us. Well, again, the Catholics uh, uh, were, were ready for this and they had a response and they brought it to these Protestant leaders who were meeting in an upper room, the second, third, fourth floor, I don't know exactly which one. The Protestants didn't take too kindly to it, so they threw two of the regents carrying these letters and their secretary out the window, hence the defenestration. Defenestrate being one of those great words, one of my all-time favorite English words, which means to throw out a window. Uh, so they threw these three out the window and the rumor, the story goes, they landed in a manure pile. Uh, now this event helped trigger what was then called the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648. If you remember anything from your world history, 17th century European history, you remember the Thirty Years' War. And so this was precipitated by the second defenestration of Prague. Now, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, you say the second defenestration of Prague, when was the first? Well, since you asked, I will tell you briefly that the first defenestration of Prague took place in 1419. And that was a situation, again, it was a religious conflict when uh, several Hussites, uh, Hussites were the followers of John Huss, one of the, uh, I guess you could call him a proto-Protestant, somebody who uh, resisted the Catholic Church. Um, and uh, his followers, Hussites, uh, got angry at seven city councilors and threw them out of a window, seven of them. And I believe those guys, many if not most of them, died. So that was the first defenestration of Prague in 1419. The second defenestration took place almost 200 years later in 1618. And of course this is a big thing in the history of Prague. Uh, there's statues and that kind of stuff and woodcuts and the like talking about the defenestrations, the various defenestrations of Prague. In fact, they, there's, uh, you know, they talk about other things as being defenestrations, although there's actually only the two times where people were literally thrown out windows. But, uh, so, enough about that. It was on this date in 1785 that Ben Franklin announced that he had invented bifocals. And yes, since you're asking, these are courtesy of Ben Franklin, one of my pairs of bifocals. So thank you, Mr. Franklin. In 1898, the first Philippine Expeditionary Force left San Francisco to fight in what was called the Philippine-American War. Now, this is not a war that we get a, hear a lot about. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about the Spanish-American War that started in 1898 and ended in 1898, whereas the Philippine-American War was one of the results. After the Spanish-American War, uh, the U.S. gained possession of the Philippines, and the Philippines thought, well, great, we're free of Spain we are going to be free. And the Americans came and said, no, not quite so fast. Uh, and so the Philippine-American War lasted about six years, uh, I'm sorry, four years, 1898 to 1902, although there was sporadic fighting. And all told, 
approximately 6,000 U.S. soldiers died, 20,000 Philippine soldiers died, and approximately, and again, these numbers vary depending on who you ask, approximately 200,000 Filipino civilians died during this time period, uh, during this war between the Philippines and the Americans. In 1934, Bonnie and Clyde were killed on a stand in Louisiana. Bonnie and Clyde, yeah, which is uh, kind of an in interesting story. I'm sure many of us have seen the movie. Um, killed on this date in 1934. And in 1958, the first cliff notes appeared in U.S. schools. Now, I know none of you know what cliff notes are. None of you ever used cliff notes. Well, the cliff notes uh, first appeared on this date in 1958 and have been around ever since. I believe they're still making them. I think they're online. Of course, now they have Sparks notes and other things like that as well. But the first time, 1958. Today is, uh, in 1875, today is Alfred P. Sloan's birthday. Alfred P. Sloan. Some of you may recognize that name from watching things on PBS where they say funding for this program is given by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Same guy. Alfred P. Sloan, one of the great early leaders in the auto business. He wrote a classic book called My Years with General Motors. If you are uh, interested in the auto business as well or at all, and given that I spent three decades in it, um, if you want to talk about how the auto business came around, Alfred P. Sloan um, was the was the uh, chief financial officer for uh, GM, and then became the president uh, for quite some time. So he was born on this date in 1875. Finally, on this date, my brother Carl was born. So happy birthday, Carl! Some of you who are with us in John, remember he. Made, I uh, made a special guest appearance when we were talking about John chapter 4, I believe, when Jesus' brothers come in with a better idea. Um, so he was born in this state. My brother is two, just over two years younger than I am, which if I'm doing the math correctly, makes him around 29, 29 today. So happy birthday, Carl. All right, well, let's get back to talking about Isaiah. We're going to make a brief excursus. This is one of my new words that I'm trying to work into my vocabulary. We're going to make a brief excursus first, and then we're going to talk about um, Isaiah chapter 6. Good morning. Welcome back. Before we get into talking about Isaiah chapter 6, I wanted to spend a minute or two, or maybe more, talking about the Old Testament in general. How do we use it? How can we uh, use it better? Uh, and this is, I'm talking about, you know, Christianity, specifically, you know, the, the Christianity that I'm familiar with is white U.S., evangelical Protestant Christianity. We tend, uh, in, in, in the U.S., we tend to use the U.S., or we tend to use the, the Old Testament in a number of ways. Let me kind of talk about these. Number one, we, we just ignore it, okay? Now, we, it, it may not be an intentional or an explicit or an overt. We just spend so much time because it's just so much easier to talk about Jesus. Isn't it great to just talk about the, you know, what Jesus did? And isn't it easier to just talk about what Paul says in the epistles? And of course, Revelation is always fun. So we just spend so much time in the New Testament because it's new as opposed to the Old Testament, which is old, okay? And and we, we kind of just have this benign neglect, which is which is really kind of interesting that we do this for, for a number of reasons. Number one, the Old Testament is the larger part of the Bible. What we call the Bible today, the, the, the 66 books, Fully 60%, maybe two-thirds of the Bible it is made up of the Old Testament, okay? This first half, the Hebrew Bible, as it were, the 39 books that we call the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, okay? It's the larger portion of, of the Bible, um, okay? It's like, you know, focusing on, you know, you take a, a large series of books, maybe take the, take the Harry Potter book, and all you ever do is read The Deathly Hallows. Now, I'm sure there are some people that do that, but, you know, you got to go through the whole series, okay? Um, it, it's So, uh, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia and only reading the last battle and just ignoring the other five, okay? So, or six, however many there are. Uh, okay, so it, it's it's the larger part of, of the Bible. But, you know, another thing is that the every time the New Testament writers are talking about the, the, the Scriptures, they're talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the Bible of the New Testament writers. 
It's the Bible, what we call the Bible of the New Testament, the first, certainly the first century and probably the second, even up into the third century church. When Jesus talks about the New Testament, or when we, Jesus talks about the scriptures, he's talking about the Old Testament. When he says, you search the scriptures because you've, then you think you find eternal life. He's talking about the Old Testament, okay? When he, when he says about, um, you know, from the blood of Abel to Zerubbabel, he's talking about the Old Testament, okay? This, these were the scriptures that they had to. In, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter reasoned from the scriptures, it was the Old Testament that he, he's talking about. In 2 Timothy 3, when Paul says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, he's talking about the Old Testament. That is what he's got in mind when he's writing that passage. Now, again, I know we go and we've, we've got ways of, you know, uh, making the New Testament scripture. And I'm not arguing that point. I'm just saying this, this benign neglect of the Old Testament doesn't really jive with how the New Testament characters, for lack of a better word, a person's involved in a New Testament narrative felt about it. Okay, in Second Peter, when Paul, when Peter says, "Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit," he's not he's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about people like Isaiah. Okay, so again, the New Testament writers lived and breathed the Old Testament. Okay, it's the Bible. Okay, Jesus refers to it often, but so so but but we tend to just kind of ignore it. Okay, now when we're not ignoring it, we do use it in other ways. Okay, some very common ways, and, and perhaps some of you have been are familiar with these, okay? We, we love the Old Testament for the Sunday school stories, okay? They make for great Sunday school stories. And we go through the Old Testament, we come up with all these great narrative events, and and then we, we, we tell them to the kids, okay? So we know all about, you know, Jonah and the Ark, and David and the 450 prophets of Baal, okay? And we, we know about, you know, all of those different different events, okay? Moses and the Flood. We know all about these Old Testament stories, and, and we, we tell them to the kids, and, and the kids come back with their little pictures of the ark and animals coming in two by two, and, and it's, it's all great fun. And, and, but when they get older, then we say, okay, now that you're older and can understand stuff, we're going to talk about the New Testament. So we kind of focus on the Old Testament stories. And we never get into really the, the, the reasons why. And, and we, we take it another direction. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But, you know, we, we focus, okay, this is great for telling kids stories. But let's, let's worry, you know, when, when they get older, they can, then we'll, we'll get them into the real part of the Bible. That is the New Testament. Okay. So we do that. Another thing that we tend to do, and this is kind of going along with using the stories for, uh, you know, Sunday school lessons, is we, is we tend to spiritualize the text. And spiritualizing the text is is where you, is most seen. And there's a lot of there's a number of different ways you can do this, but a number of one, one of the most common ways that this happens is when you you take a narrative, and a narrative is is a story. It's a it's a there's characters, there's people. Somebody goes from point A to point B. Now this is not like a parable, where you know that a, that's a whole different thing but we're just talking about a narrative so there, there was a king and the king went out to battle and he lost the battle and then there was another king or uh, all of these different narrative stories and we look at these narrative stories and we say well so and so did this and this good result ended therefore you can do the same thing okay and good things will happen to you okay for example I heard a sermon once about um, uh, Genesis, in Genesis, I want to say 15, where Abraham sends a servant to get a wife for his son Isaac. And the, the story goes that the servant went and he did several things. He talked here, he did this, this, and this, this. And the preacher who was preaching this particular sermon said, okay, now this is how you find God's will for your life. Now he didn't say anything about whether it's going to get you a wife, but he did say if you do just what this guy did, and you did just what this guy did, and you did just what this guy did, then you're going to have God's will for your life because it worked for the servant and he got Rebecca for um, for Isaac. Okay, that's spiritual spiritualizing the text. That's like taking it a direction it wasn't meant to go. Okay, so that story in Genesis is not there to tell you how to find God's will for your life. That's a whole nother thing. But that story is there to explain how Isaac got his wife. Okay, and that led to Isaac, Jacob, etc nation of Israel, life of Christ, okay? Or, or for another, another way we spiritualize the text is we, we look at the David and Goliath story and we say, David, David picked up five stones, 
Okay, he picked up five stones, and there's another passage which suggests that Goliath had five brothers, or four brothers, so there would be five of them. So David was planning on battling both Goliath and then his four brothers. Okay, so th and this is all speculation, but then it's like, okay, there's five giants, and there are five giants in your life, and you need five stones to defeat these five giants, and these are the five giants you need in your life. Okay, that's spirit plays in the text. That's, okay, we, we, we ignore, you know, do that at your, at your own peril. Samson pushed on two pillars at the end of his life, and you need to push on the two pillars that are holding you back, and the pillar of this and the pillar of that. Okay, these are, these are, are spiritualizing the text. Okay, it's kind of a narrative misuse. Okay, again, you gotta be really careful talking about narratives. And it's in, in the New Testament as well. You know, just because Jesus did something in, in a certain way and talked to somebody and something happened, doesn't mean that if you do the same thing, the same result is gonna happen to you. There's no promise within the text that says that. Okay, so we tend to use the New Old Testament in that way. Another thing that we do, and, and perhaps this is a little more spiritual, so to speak, is is we we use the old testament to look for jesus okay so we go through the old testament and say well, i'm going to look for jesus because we start with the assumption well the jesus is the central character of the bible it's all about jesus and so we look for jesus in the old testament and so we look at all of these different examples and we say that this is this is about Jesus, this is about Jesus, this is about Jesus. Whether any of the, the writers at the time could have thought that or whether any of the New Testament writers could have thought that. I think Origen was the first one to do this in, a, in, the, in the third century. He decided that he was gonna go back through the Old Testament and find Jesus, because Jesus is, is hidden in the Old Testament. You may, you may have heard that. Jesus is hidden in the Old Testament. He, Jesus is not hidden anywhere, okay? But oh, he's saying we need to go in there and find him. Okay, Jesus is not lost in the Old Testament, and and the result of this is you get commonly held beliefs and you know generally accepted beliefs. The passages, for example, and here's my first attempt at a at a, at a die heretic moment for the day. Genesis three fifteen, I will put enmity between thee and the woman between I see thee. Okay, my King James is coming out. Okay, the so called proto evangelium. Okay, Origen went back, looked at that, and said that's a prediction of Christ. That is the first prediction of Christ. And this has become just generally accepted belief that, okay, that's about Christ. Well, it's not. Okay, it's not. It's a prediction of this ongoing conflict that's going to happen as a result of the fall, of which Jesus' life, death, and burial has a part, but it is not the focus of it. It's the focus is the struggle, not Jesus. Okay, but we've accepted it. And even when you go through that, if you look at any of the analysis where people explain that, you have to go through with this discussion of seed versus seeds and plural versus singular and this, that, and the other kind of stuff. And it's like, you, you really got to make some leaps, but everybody accepts that because for, for uh, you know, 1800 years, that's what, we, that's what we believe, okay? And again, I know that's a commonly held understanding, but it just isn't there. But it's from somebody looking for Jesus in the Old Testament is where we got that, okay? Now, I know what you're thinking to yourself. Wait a minute. You're going to go to Isaiah 7, and, and you're going to go to Isaiah 7, and we're going to go to Isaiah 9, where we're talking about a child being born. Okay, and that child doesn't reference Jesus, and the people there couldn't have known about Jesus. How do we know that's about Jesus, and Genesis 3 isn't? I'll tell you why. I'm glad you asked. We know Isaiah 7 and 9 are about Jesus because the New Testament writers, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, told us it was. Okay, so in Genesis 3, you've got no New Testament writer looking back and going, oh yeah, this is, okay. So, again, we go looking for Jesus in, in the Old Testament, okay. And again, when you, yeah, again, Jesus isn't hidden in the Old Testament, okay. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Okay, first of all, when we look at the the, the Old Testament, we need to realize uh, first of, first and foremost something about the Bible in general, and that is this: the Bible is a book about God. Okay, the Bible is God's revelation of Himself. Okay, every story, every narrative, every uh, command, everything in there tells us something about God. Okay, and that's the first question whenever you're looking at any passage of Scripture. That is the first question you should ask. What does this passage tell me about God? And then what should I do as a result? 
Now recognize there have been some changes, okay? Specific application of the Old Testament law was done away with as a result of the, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, okay? We know that from Romans and Galatians and other New Testament works, okay? So specific application of the, the Old Testament law, I mean, no meat not, or not eating pork and, you know, the Sabbath rules, okay? That, that went away, okay? But the reasons behind that didn't. Okay, so God told Israel to, to follow these particular rules and regulations for a reason. Okay, now the rules may have changed because of being in this new covenant or the new dispensation, depending on what you want to call it. But the reason behind it did not. And so as we go through the Old, we can go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we can see what this passage is saying. We can see what the circumstances, and we can say, what does this tell us about God? What does this tell us about God's expectation for his people? And how should we then apply it? How should we then react? So when we look at Isaiah, and Isaiah says to the people um, over and over and over and over again, you're being judged because you didn't plead the widow's cause. You didn't help the fatherless. You didn't uh, help the oppressed. Okay, You didn't help the poor. What does that tell you about God? God is a, a, a being who demands this kind of action, demands this kind of treatment of his people, okay? Now, we can't dismiss that because, well, you know, it's not in the New Testament, okay? No, this is telling us something about God, and it's the same God in the Old Testament that it is in the New Testament, okay? So I appreciate all of you who are with me here as we're in Isaiah and, and as we're looking to apply the, these principles that Isaiah is talking about um, and, and how it, it can affect what we do in our life today. Okay, so with that, now we're going to get into talking about Isaiah chapter 6. Let's get there. Welcome back. Now we're going to get into talking about Isaiah chapter 6. But before I do that, I want to just make a quick mention of something I forgot to point out last week. And that is in Isaiah chapter 2, uh, there's a passage, uh, it says, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be ex exalted above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Uh, chapters 2 through 4, uh, I'm sorry, verses 2 through 4. Those verses are very similar, almost exact, to a passage that's in the book of Micah. And it turns out that Micah and, and Isaiah are contemporaries. Um, that Isaiah is sort of in the urban area and uh, Micah is in the kind of the rural areas. Uh, and, it, and, and so this particular passage has caused some fun slash fits to Bible scholars because, you know, when you have the two, then you, you th think one copied off of the other um, or perhaps they all both were copied off of a different source. Um, of course, it is also possible, although most people don't think that both, of, both writers would be independently inspired to write the same thing. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't, there isn't a good answer. Nobody really knows. I, I just wanted to acknowledge it. It doesn't change the um, inspiration level of it. Because in fact, as you go through Isaiah, you find there are passages that are very similar to other passages, um, especially in Kings, uh, 2 Kings 22 through 26 and Chronicles 26, First Chronicles 26, where we're talking about some of these kings and some of the stuff that happens, that there are passages that are very similar. And for that reason, uh, there are some people who would look at some of the books like Kings and Chronicles, and Isaiah is potentially one of the authors because he was there and could write these things and knew about them. Perhaps, I don't know. But I just wanted to point that out. So, okay, so let's talk about Isaiah chapter 6 here today. Interesting story here because we, we, we went through Isaiah 1 through 5, and this is Isaiah just indicting the Hebrew community for all of the different things. He, he, he goes back and forth saying, this is what you should have been, this is what you are, this is what you should have been, this is what you are. Okay, and, and at the end of chapter 5, after that, 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 that uh, story of the, of the garden, he has the indictment of... Um, how these nations are going to come and and uh, take over and all of these things that are going to happen, okay? Now in Isaiah chapter 6, we have what is often referred to, and we'll talk about this, Isaiah's call or his commission, okay? And this is interesting for a number of reasons, okay? 
One of them is the fact that it's in Isaiah chapter 6 and not in Isaiah chapter 1. Okay, because most of the other uh, prophets, uh, when they start their, they start with their call. God called me to do this. Okay, whereas Isaiah gives this long uh, indictment, this five chapter indictment. What you know, again, the chapters are arbitrary, but it's just this long indictment of the nation of Israel and, and Judah and Israel, and then you have his commission. Okay. So some have said that, well, this is sort of weird. It should have been at first and, you know, kind of getting into the placement of things. But I think I think it, it just sets up, um, was Isaiah preaching before this? Perhaps. Was he in ministry before this? Perhaps. Um, what we know is that there are no other passages, there are no other texts, manuscripts, I mean, where this comes at the start. So it isn't that somebody just stuck it. I mean, when this book was originally put together, Whoever put it together, and again, it may have been Isaiah, but it was more likely to be the people in, in the exile. They said, listen, this, I, this indictment comes first. So Isaiah knows what he's getting into when, when we go into this, okay? Or so that the readers know, he's like, better yet, the readers know what Isaiah is getting into when he volunteers for this, this task, Okay. So let's let's get into talking about Isaiah 6. Now, like I said before, you if you've been in the church for any length of time, you have probably heard messages about Isaiah chapter 6, okay? Um, and so I kind of want to keep this in the context of what is going on within the book itself, okay? And we'll make a couple of references to a contemporary usage. Okay, chapter 6, verse 1. In the year the king Uzziah died. Okay, let's just start right there. King Uzziah goes by two names in the Old Testament. It's either Uzziah or Azariah, okay? So, in, in, and you can read the story of Uzziah's life in um, 2 Kings 22 through 25, 1 Kings 26. And, and basically, the, the story is that Uzziah was a pretty good king, okay? By all tokens, he was a good king. Not as good a king as, as Hezekiah, um, but a pretty good king nonetheless, okay? But... Due to a series of circumstances, he is afflicted with leprosy near the end of his life, okay? And basically spends the end of his life in a, in a room because, again, having leprosy, he would, um, there would be a pain. Again, and it, it has to do with disobedience and, and things like that. So, but, but he was, you know, the, the, the kingdom, he was king for a very long time. The kingdom was prosperous. The kingdom was safe, okay? In the year the king Uzziah died, he has this vision. Isaiah has this vision. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Okay. Now, some people have looked at this and said, <clears throat> have looked at this and said that this is something sequential. The king Uzziah died, and then I saw the throne. Now, that may in fact be right, but I think that the text really is just this is a marker of when this occurred. Because again, Uzziah's last years were spent in a room. So there. It isn't necessarily that at the end of his life he was a very strong, effective king because he couldn't be seen, he couldn't be out in public, okay? So it, it's, really a, it, it's really a placeholder, okay? So, for example, I can say with all honesty, that in the year of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I was born, okay? And people would know that, oh, that just tells me the year that I, he was born. Now, I was born before the Cuban Missile Crisis, Okay, so the Cuban Missile Crisis didn't have to happen for that. Okay, so that's just kind of, you know, one way to, to look at this. And I think it's just giving the year. And the year, by the way, is about 739 or 740. So when we talk about the ministry of Isaiah, it's usually dated from the death of King Uzziah only because of this passage. Okay. And it doesn't really say necessarily that he didn't, he wasn't preaching before then, or he did not feel himself to be a prophet beforehand. He just got this event took place in the year that King Uzziah died. Okay. Now again, Uzziah was a great king, good king, um, and and it could very well have been that it took the death of Uzziah for Isaiah to see the Lord. That is possible, but you can't draw that from the text. And I just say that because I have heard sermons that make that point, that Uzziah's greatness was blinding Isaiah, okay? That may be true, but you can't draw that from the text. So, in the year the king Uzziah died, I, that is Isaiah, 
saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, this is a vision that Isaiah is having. Okay, he's having a vision. And when he says the train, that, that word there generally refers to the hem. So really, in terms of seeing the God, you know, because again, you've got the Bible says no man has seen God, and yet you've got all these examples of what are called theophanies, or that is appearances, Old Testament appearances of God, or Christophanies, Old Testament appearances of Christ, of, of who we, the, the, you know, appearances of Christ, let's just leave it at that. Um, but here, all he can describe is the ham and its size and its magnificence, okay? And it's, so so he's just talking about this, this, and he recognizes where he is, but it's, it's such a grand thing, okay? He sees the Lord. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So he's setting the scene here where you had these seraphim. And again, I'm not going to get into the details of the six wings and what they're covering and all that. Okay, They're saying two things that are interesting. One, holy, holy, holy. Okay. Saying something three times is, is what in, in the Hebrew word there's a tri, what do they call it? Trisagion. Okay, that, that is another way of just using absolute holiness. Okay, this absolute holiness. And it, it's identifying God. It's identifying his character, something about him. Now, what's interesting is when we, we talk about holiness, especially when we look at it from this side of the New Testament, we, we, we think of holiness as being that otherness. But to the Jews at the time, to the Hebrews at the time, holiness, based on Leviticus 17, be holy as I am holy, this was this had an ethical implication to it. That it, it, it implied something about what you do. So you should be like God is because God is like that. Okay, so it was something attainable in a sense. Okay, we couldn't get the you know, they, they couldn't get that absolute holiness. But there was, a, there, there was a series of things, again, talking about the Old Testament and, and what the expectations were. Okay, so that expectation is given to the Jews, given to the Hebrew nation, the nation of Israel, and that is still today. We should be holy, for, for God is holy. Okay, let me, let me read a passage here from Oswald. That's kind of a couple of, several sentences, but I, I just thought it was interesting about this idea of holiness. And again, this is from um, John Oswald's, uh, commentary. What was distinct about this deity, and again, he's talking about what these seraphim are saying about the vision of God that he's having, was not so much his origin, his essence, or his numinous power. Rather, it was his attitude toward ethical behavior. Other nations had laws and saw these laws as deriving from the deity, for example, the Code of Hammurabi, yet none of these saw these laws as being an essential expression of what made God to be God. But this is exactly what the Old Testament says. The entire nation will be holy to God, and they will be manifest, and they will manifest that special relationship through a particular species of ethical behavior. This is the meaning of the so-called holiness code in Leviticus. You shall be holy as I am holy. Leviticus 19. I'm sorry, I said Leviticus 17. The, I'm sorry, uh, ba, ba, ba. you shall be holy as I am holy does not refer to ritual pur purity, but rather ethical behavior. Thus, for the Hebrews, holiness came to have a very particular ethical cast. To oppress the helpless was to profane God's name. To make use of a prostitute, regardless of the fact that she was called holy, was to defile the holy name of God. Look in Amos 2. To be holy was to behave ethically, and to be unholy was, in ultimate sense, not to be culturally impure, but to be ethically impure. And this refers to Ezekiel 36. So for Isaiah, the announcement of God's holiness meant that he was in the presence of one distinct form other than himself. But for Isaiah, as a Hebrew... It also meant that the terrifying otherness was not merely in essence, but in character. Here was one ethically pure, absolutely upright, utterly true. So when we look at the book of Isaiah, and by this, it learn to do good and gives you the things or oppression. He's talking about his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Again, talking about this being that Isaiah is looking at. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay. Again, go back to Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows us. Again, my King James is showing. You know, the, 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 the firmament day under day uttereth speech, night unto night uttereth knowledge. Okay. So again, 
The whole earth is full of his glory. And this is at that moment it, it was happening, okay? And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, and it's this, this Isaiah is recognizing it, where he was and who he was in front of. And at that point, he said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is one of those situations where just once he realizes where he is, he realizes, I don't have a leg to stand on. Okay, I am, I am a man of unclean lips. Now, this is one of the reasons why, because where he says, I am a man of unclean lips, they think he wasn't preaching beforehand. Okay, people look at him and say, well, he had, un he had unclean lips beforehand, so it wasn't until he had clean lips that he got the message. That is possible. And it makes perfect sense. But you can't prove that from the text. Okay, it could just be he didn't realize his own position until he was in the presence, or he had this vision of being in the presence of God. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So again, there's, a, there's an interesting thing going on here that in the presence of God, Isaiah recognizes his sin. Okay. He recognizes his sin. He acknowledges his own sin. I am a man of unclean lips. And the forgiveness that is given matches what was needed. Okay? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And what is confession? Confession is not simply telling God something. Okay? Because being omniscient, he already knows. It's just recognizing or agreeing with God that what you are dealing with you have the same opinion of it that he does. So I'm a man of unclean it. And the, the, the forgiveness matches what the sin was. Behold, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? So now Isaiah is in this, in this vision and he hears this voice and he recognizes it as the voice of the Lord asking this question, Who will I send and who will go for us? Okay. Now, this is not the first time that this sort of construction happens. In in 1 Kings 22, I think it is, in 1 Kings 22, there's another example um, where the prophet Micaiah, Micaiah is talking about a heavenly moment where it says the, the Lord asks this sort of a general question. Who, who's going to do this for me? Okay. And, but Isaiah steps in and Isaiah volunteers. He says, here am I send me. Okay, here I am, send me. So Isaiah volunteers here. Okay, now this is important because usually if you've heard this in a, in a message, you've heard this, God is calling Isaiah, and Isaiah responds to the call. Okay, yeah, that's a little, you know, you're kind of taking it, you're, you're actually what you're doing is you're looking at it in the context of the, the, the teaching about calling, getting called to something. Okay, that, that God has a calling for you that is specific to you and nobody else. Okay, not exactly what's going on here. Okay, there's a general call goes out, Isaiah volunteers. Okay, and I think that is still true. There is a general call out for people to be holy as I am holy, and it is up to us to volunteer. Okay, so Isaiah volunteers for, for this. Okay. Um, it's not a call like other prophets got. There's a, there isn't an indication that most of the other prophets in the Old Testament had a choice. Okay, remember Jonah? Okay, God said to Jonah, hey, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I don't know, I think I'll go the other direction. Okay, Jonah wasn't given a choice. Jonah was told to go, and he had to go. Okay, God said, you know, and then he tried to go the other way. And I, I think with a lot of the other um, prophets in the Old Testament, they weren't really given a choice. Here, Isaiah is given a choice. Okay, so he, he has this thing. Now, the thing is, most of the messages about Isaiah 6, when, when you hear them, stop right here. Here am I, send me, and, and you should, you know, God is calling you to the mission field. God is calling you to go into ministry. God is calling you to, and, and it's usually this kind of thing. And again, I could go off on this, uh, this rabbit trail. Um, you know, God is calling you to some specific thing, you know, and, and, 
you know, whether that's a correct use of, again, I don't, don't want to get into that. Actually, I do want to get into that, but I don't have the time to get into this because we, we stop right here. And this is interesting because whereas, now, now Jesus does make a mention in the New Testament about Isaiah seeing the glory of God. But as far as the actual call, it's not mentioned again in the, in the New Testament. Yet the second half of Isaiah 6 is mentioned multiple times. Because he, so, so the voice of the Lord says to Isaiah, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their ears, I'm sorry, see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Okay, now this is, this is a, a problematic passage. And yet the fact of the matter is, that's what it says. Your ministry is going to fail. So Isaiah has this great moment. Here am I, send me. And God says, great, go out, give this message. And by the way, it's going to fail. Okay, you're going you're gonna to do your message and they're not going to believe you. Okay, that make the heart of this people dull in their ears, heavy and blind their eyes. Okay, so if you happen to be a universalist, and a universalist is a person who believes that at some point all people will uh, be accepted into heaven, you kind of have to come to this passage and go, wait a minute, what about this? Here, here, you know, God is telling Isaiah, yeah, I got this message, and I've got this message of holiness, and I've got this message uh, of, of returning to me, but it's going to fail. And, Isaiah, and so Isaiah ha has, um, uh, and Isaiah says in verse 11, how long? A reasonable question. Okay, how long am I, do I need to continue this? How long do I need to continue doing this? And, and he, he doesn't get a specific answer relative to himself. He says, until the city is the lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Okay, so as far as Isaiah is concerned, it, it, it's his entire life. Okay, so he, he's doomed to a ministry that is going to ultimately fail in the sense of creating any kind of revival, okay? Which is like, you know, we, we really don't like that, especially in US-based ministry, you know? Again, the, the way we, we've structured it, that we want to see results, and it makes sense, don't get me wrong, it makes sense that you want to see results, but yet Isaiah is told, you're not going to, you're not going to be seeing any results here. Now, interestingly, this passage, this, this verse, uh, verse 10, 10 and 11 is actually mentioned in all four Gospels and in the book of Acts. So this is, this is used to talk about Jesus' ministry and, and the ministry of what we would call the New Testament. Um, this is used in Jesus' ministry to describe his, his effect, that not everybody's going to believe. Not everybody is going to fall in line. Not everybody is going to accept it. Okay. Go in, why does the gate, you know, that leads to destruction? Why does the path, you know, narrows the way that leads to truth? Okay, so here, it's, it starts here. Okay, not everybody's going to get it. Now, at the time, I don't know how Isaiah went out of there. Let me finish the, the phrase. Let me, no, I don't know how Isaiah walked out of there and go, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this thing. Okay, but I think when they put this together, that is, a hundred or so years later, when, when Isaiah was put together as the book that we know it today, I think that those who are looking at this were, were looking at this passage and saying, this is important because we should have known. Because at the time they're putting it together in exile, the land is in waste. There, everything is burned down. We should have known. We should have seen this coming. Okay. After the, okay. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, and this is talking about this, this remnant, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak, whose stump remains when it is fouled. Okay, so, so you think what happened is, okay, you think when you cut a tree down and you leave a stump, what do you, what do, you do? Well, then you go in and you grind out the stump. So I, I think the Lord is saying, listen, how long are you going to do this? Not till the first devastation or the second i mean uh, the final devastation you're going to continue to talk about this okay your stump remains and the holy seed is its stump okay now this little phrase here at the end okay on the one hand you think wait a minute there's something something to come here something 
We don't know what. And well, there's other passages where we're going to kind of come back to this idea of a stump, that what is going to come out of the stump. However, we don't want to make too big a deal because there are some, and there, there are not a lot of this in the Old Testament manuscripts, but this is one of them, that this particular phrase at the end isn't in all of the manuscripts. Okay, It's in most, but it's not in all. So um, some have suggested that this is what they call an emendation or a correction or an addition. Could be. We don't really know. Okay. So at the end of chapter 6, we know that Isaiah has a mission. Isaiah has a commission. He has accepted a commission. He has volunteered for this, this uh, commission to take the message of God, this, this vision of holiness, to the people, knowing it's not going to work, knowing it's not going to be successful. Okay, How many of us would sign up for that? You know, I have a job for you to do. I have a message for you and nobody's going to believe you. How many would sign up for that? Not too many. Okay, it'd just be, let's just say it wouldn't be uh, something that would be appealing about the gig. But Isaiah took it. Okay, now next week we're going to get into uh, 7 through 9. Okay, now we're going to get into a, a narrative story uh, and a couple, a couple more of Isaiah's greatest hits are going to come up, especially in chapter 7 and verse 9. So thanks for being with me today. And we'll see you next week. Isaiah's ministry lasted over a period of approximately half a century. It continued through the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Tradition tells us that he suffered a martyr's death during the reign of King Manasseh. His work brought him into direct contact with... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just preparing for next week. Um, I, I, I read the book, actually. No. All right, I'm just kidding. Hey, I, if you've made it this far, I just wanted to let you know something, and that is this. Last week had a little bit of an issue with the uploading, and the little bit of an issue is that somebody, moi, forgot to put the link into the Facebook notice. So for those of you who are interested, I just figured I would let you know that I upload these uh, sessions every whenever, whenever I upload them, but they're always scheduled to be uh, published to YouTube at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. So if you subscribe to the Stan and Debbie Ray YouTube channel, you'll see these as soon as they're uploaded. If you ever wanted to do it, say, before 9 o'clock. Or if for, perhaps I forget to put the link in the Facebook page again. So, again, if you don't know where the Stan and Debbie Ray YouTube channel is, one, you just go to YouTube and find it, uh, search for it. Or the next time you see a link, just click on the link, go back, and then you should be at the Stan and Debbie Ray YouTube channel. And you should be able to get to it from there. But that might be a help for anyone. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to go back to using my resources and uh, studying this. So thank you very much, and I'll see you next week.